friends, hello there. Welcome to another episode in the teaching series and I cannot wait to get into today's episode. But before we do so, just wanna remind those of you who may be interested in joining the Infusion Bible Conference this summer in West Michigan, June 8, 9, and 10, we're gonna be tackling Paul and his Roman world. We currently have an early bird discount going on until April 3rd, it's more than 20% off. And so I'd love to invite you to check out infusionbibleconference.com, seeing what we're up to for this particular conference on Paul. And here's what's gonna be super fun. This week, I am taking off with my wife to go to Italy to join up with Randy Smith who will also be teaching at this summer's IBC. And we are going to build out a good part of the conference while we are in Rome. Why not, right? So for those of you who have been to the IBC before, we're taking it to the next level this summer. For those of you who have not been before, this would be a great first conference to join because understanding Paul in his Roman context, changes how you understand what Paul was writing. And so I'd love to have you check out Infusion Bible Conference and come join us in West Michigan in June. Alrighty, we are in part five of the parable of the lost son. And in the last two episodes, we looked at the story through the eyes of the younger son predominantly, and then the last episode through the eyes of the father. And in this episode, I want to look at it through the eyes of the older brother. And so Luke 15 is where the story is. It's the only place that it's recorded. And when it comes to the older brother, there are two major moments. And moment one, you may go, well, how is the older brother involved in moment one? Oh, check this out, how the story begins. Luke 15, 11 to 12, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. Now, we've looked at this and how this would have been tantamount for the younger son to say to the father, I wish you were dead. And he says, Father, give me my share of the estate. And then it says, so he divided his property between them. So what's the problem? The problem is the older son does not step in to this situation. This is huge. You see, there is a rift going on between the father and the younger son. And the moment the younger son asks for his inheritance, it would have been proper in the cultural context for the older brother to loudly refuse and reject what his younger brother was doing. And then on the heels of that, because there is a fractured relationship, the role of the reconciler is supposed to be taken up by the older brother. So whenever there is a fracture of relationships in the ancient world and even in the Middle East today, the person that is closest to both parties has a responsibility to step in what is called the role of the reconcile, re- reconciler to reconcile the two parties together. And the older brother doesn't do it. Furthermore, Jesus tells us that when it came to the father, so he divided his property between them. The older brother accepted his share of the inheritance. The two thirds of the inheritance that was to be given to both boys, the older brother got. Friends, understand here in moment one that Jesus' listeners would have made the connection that although the older son stayed, he was just as guilty as the younger son who left. Moment one. And this is why what we see in moment one that makes moment two so unbelievably explosive. So you know what happens next in the story. The younger son liquidates his inheritance. He heads off to the far country. He gets in dire straits. He wants to be a servant, you know, to his father. He comes up with this elaborate plan. He comes back. He is met by the grace of the father. He is hugged. He is given a robe, a ring, sandals, and the grace of the father showers him. And now 
the older brother is going to find out about the younger brother coming home and what the father has done. Notice how the story continues in verse 22. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fat and calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So the operative word here in the midst of this is they're going to celebrate. They're going to celebrate. Twice this word shows up. And remember, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, they're all seen in connection to one another. And what is in those first two parables? It's celebration. So there's a celebration that is going on. And then we read in verse 25 and following, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. So the brother is out in the field and he is unaware of everything that is going on. Now, notice what Craig Keener, in his commentary, the IVP Bible Backgrounds Commentary on the New Testament, says about this moment. He says that the elder brother is apparently the only person in the village uninformed about the party bursts the bounds of plausibility in the real world, where the elder brother should himself have taken the lead at reconciling father and younger son. This touch of unrealism is necessary to graphically underline the older brother's isolation from the community. Now, this is huge because, again, Jesus is just telling a story. And the details of the story are used to accentuate certain facets. And there is this isolation. There is this gap going on with the older brother. Now, this is what happens after the older brother finds out about this. Says the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Now, friends, this is huge that he refused to go in. Because this would have been an incredibly shameful moment. It's as if the community is watching this story. Because, by the way, if you're killing a fattened calf, it's not just for the family. This is to reconcile with the entire community. And as we explore through the eyes of the younger son, when he shames his father and says, I want my inheritance now, liquidates it, leaves town, Like he not only shames his father, he not only shames his family, he shames the entire community. And we talked about that the reason why the father ran to the younger son in part was to shield his younger son from the shame of the community, to let the rest of the community know that the father has reconciled to the younger son. And so this whole thing of shame is playing out here. And so the older brother has actually shamed the father by not stepping in, refusing the younger son's request for not stepping in as the role of the reconciler and even accepting his inheritance. All of this is playing on to shaming the father. And now he is out in the field and he refuses to go in. And not only does the father accept this, if you will, But then the father shames himself by going out and pleading with the older son to come in. Something the host of the party would never do in a first century contextual world. And so we see this playing out and the father goes out and begins to plead with him. But he answered his father, look. Notice here, he doesn't even address his father with a proper title of father. Even the younger son did that when he came home and he had an agenda. The older son is so ripped at the father that he won't even give him a proper address. He jumps in and says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Oh no, he is a son in the father's household. And yet he sees himself as a slave. 
and you've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, notice this, he doesn't even want to identify that this is his own brother who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. And then notice how the father responds, my son, not my servant, not my slave, my son. The father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours, you want to reject him as his brother, but this is your brother. This is family was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Oh man, this thing is just laced in tension and confrontation. And so we just step back from the story for a moment. We go, okay, so what's the older brother's issue? Well, I think that's a misnomer because I don't think it's issue. I think it's issues. I think there are several issues that are on the scene, but they always go one level deeper. So let's start with kind of like what I would see as issue one. He identifies that when he's talking to his father, he says, when this son of yours comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. He is angry about the calf. Friends, to kill a fattened calf is to feed lots and lots of people. I mean, this is for the village. This is not just for the family. And you don't just kill the fattened calf for kicks and giggles. This is huge. This is significant. And a fattened calf was very costly. And by the way, if we are told, which we are in the beginning of the story, that the father divided the inheritance between his two sons, then technically who owns the calf? The older son does. And so he is angry at the father's generosity because it comes at a cost to him because the calf has been killed. Now, I already hinted at what's the layer beneath that because it's not just the fattened calf. The bigger issue for the brother is that he despises his father's grace to his younger brother. The father ran out. He hugged him. He gave him a robe and ring and sandals. And now he's killed the fattened calf. And he is angry at the grace of the father to let the younger brother off so easily in spite of everything that he has done. But there's even another level, I believe, deeper than this. And that I believe we can see when he says to the father, I have been slaving for you and I have never disobeyed your orders. And I would just put it this way, that the older son, he sees obedience as the means to obtaining the father's love and acceptance. That's his biggest issue is that he sees his obedience and what he does for the father as a way to obtain the father's love, to obtain the father's acceptance, to actually be a functioning member of the family or to be seen as being part of the family. And this is the deepest issue that is playing out. And the great reveal in the story is that when we see how the older son responds, is that the older son is lost as well. We have been calling this the parable of the lost son, but the great reveal here in the story is that it's not the parable of the lost son. It's the parable of the lost sons. Both of the boys were lost. And as we recall the whole context around this, why did Jesus tell this story in the first place? Why did he tell the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin? It was out of a response to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who were angry that Jesus was welcoming sinners and tax collectors, having a meal with them, those who were seen on the outside. And so there are these actual characters that Jesus is engaging with. And then he tells these stories in response to the situation that has unfolded as he is sharing a meal with those who are on the outside. 
And so when you look at the story here, and you've got the tax collectors and sinners, I believe that they are represented in the younger son. That the Pharisees and the teachers, and I want to be very careful here, this is not about the Jews, this is about religious people. This is about people who follow God and see themselves as religious. I believe in this story that they are represented in the older son. And then, of course, God and Jesus, as he's living out this ministry, is the father in the story. And what is so interesting to me is that when you look at the tax collectors and the sinners, and you look at the Pharisees and the teachers, is that the younger son represents those who are lost but have been found. Jesus is sharing a meal. He is welcomed. He has accepted them. They have been found. And Jesus goes, we need to celebrate this. And he tells three stories about how to celebrate those who are lost but are found. But it is in this story, the story of the lost sons, where it goes another level deeper because the older son represents those who think they are found but are actually lost. Those who are on the inside. Those who are in the family, if you will, are actually a bit lost. And for the older son, he sees obedience as the means to obtaining the father's love and acceptance. And I believe Jesus was challenging the religious people in the room that day. That when it comes to our relationship to God, God doesn't love us because we are obedient. God loves us for who we are. But here's the key though. We are obedient because we love God. We don't do it to earn God's love and acceptance. We do it precisely because we love God and the relationship that God has invited us into. Friends, God's love language is obedience because it is through our obedience that we demonstrate to God that we actually recognize this relationship that we're in and that God wants us to take him seriously and his word. And by living a life of obedience, we demonstrate our love to God that we want to live this relationship out the way that God is inviting us into. But friends, we do not earn our way into God's love and acceptance. And I believe that this is the issue for the older brother. This is what Jesus was challenging the religious leaders on. And I would just summarize it this way, that when you employ a works righteousness mentality in a grace oriented home, you can become numb, bitter, angry, entitled, jealous, and judgmental. And friends, this is precisely what we see with the older son. He sees the father's household as a works righteousness place, but the father sees it as a grace oriented home where the father extends this extravagant grace because he wants everyone to experience what it's like to be found and to be welcomed into his home. And even here we see that when he's, the father says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. What's astounding to me is the father says, everything I have is yours. And yet the older son has it all. And yet he doesn't think he has anything at all. And that's because he has misunderstood how the father's house works. It is a grace oriented place that is not dependent upon a works righteousness mentality. And as a result of this, we see with the older brother, he is bitter, he is angry, he feels entitled, he's jealous with what God has done with the younger brother, he's judgmental in what he is saying. And so friends, how do we know that we are a bit lost on the inside? Like what is an indicator for us to let us know that if we have slipped into a works righteousness mentality rather than functioning within a grace oriented family? How do we know this? Well, friends, I think there is an indicator. And that indicator, I believe, is joy. And that the question we need to ask is, do we have joy? Do you have joy? Because, friends, I believe that joy is the litmus test of whether we're experiencing a thriving relationship with God or if we're a bit lost on the inside. 
that we have lost the plot. We have misunderstood what it's like to be in relationship with God. We have misunderstood what it's like to celebrate other people, especially those that we do not believe are deserving of the grace that we have received or the grace that we see God lavishing upon them. And if we start to feel a sense of, well, they don't deserve that. They haven't earned that. Look what I have done. Friends, I believe that we have lost the plot and that we begin to experience that bitterness or that resentment or that jealousy or that anger or that, oh, they don't deserve that. And when that happens, that robs us and steals us of joy. And that, friends, joy is the test. That if we exude joy, if we have a sense of joy because we understand the grace of the Father, we understand how much we have been forgiven, then we can extend that grace to other people. We can celebrate when other people have been lost and have been found, especially those people that maybe we don't readily associate with or are very different than us. We can join in on the celebration because we are exuding with a sense of joy because we are in right relationship with the Father. We recognize what the Father is all about and we are willing to be a conduit that passes that grace and that mercy on to other people. And I love how Jesus ends the story because he says, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brothers of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And that's it. The story is left with the father and the older son in the field. And the father's like, hey, there's a party going on. Do you want to join it? And I believe that Jesus ends the parable here to confront his audience to say, hey, there's a party going on. The Father is celebrating. Heaven is celebrating. Do you want to join the party or not? And the older son had a decision to make, and we have no idea what decision he made. But I believe that we are called to finish the story. And friends, I believe that if we have joy, we'll always want to join the party. So friends, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for listening. I pray that the Holy Spirit challenges you in this teaching of where we've acted like the older brother, where we may be acting like the older brother. And may we get back to the heart of the Father to experience the kind of joy that will always want to join the party. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And may we live out this story well in our lives.